So welcome back to Organic Chemistry 338 Labs. We are going to do uh, saponification of methyl benzoin today. And before we begin our experiment, it's always important to make sure we are protected and we have PPE on. I have my goggles that will protect my eyes. I have my lab coat. I have gloves. I have trousers that go all the way to my ankles and I have closed toe shoes. I also have lap coat sufficiently lengthy so that when I extend my arms, they don't expose my skin. With that all in place, we can begin our experiment. This is the reaction scheme for our experiment. We have methyl benzoate and as you can figure out from the name benzoate that means it's an ester and what are we going to do is we are going to convert an ester into a carboxylic acid as you have studied conversion of an ester to a carboxylic acid is one of the hydrolysis reactions and we are going to use sodium hydroxide in water to to hydrolyze this ester bond. Our product is benzoic acid and methanol. This product is solid, but it would remain soluble in an alkaline conditions. So then we, in the workup conditions, we will have to acidify our solutions to extract our acid. Welcome back. We have heated our reaction at reflux for 30 minutes and at this point I'm going to turn off my heat and slowly pull the lap jack down so that my sand bath which is hot does not touch my round bottom glass. I will let it stir so that Cooling is efficient due to conve convection. And as this is coming to room temp, you need to prepare for the next filtration step, for which I have a stemless funnel. I have a 50 milliliters early mark flask. I have a filter paper and I have a stand which has a O-ring attached at a suitable height. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my filter paper and fold it into half, make a nice semicircle, and fold it into half one more time so that you have folded your filter paper to a quarter. And now you will have filter paper that looks like this. What At this point, what you have to do is take three folds towards one side and let one fold go on the other side so that you have a nice cone which you can fit into your uh, stemless funnel. And you can place the stemless funnel on the O-ring and place your early map flask underneath and this so as you can see this is coming out right it is not sticking a, a nice trick to keep it at its position is to use some distilled water and gently moisten the filter paper since our reaction is also aqueous media it won't matter because we are not introducing any extra or any other solvent. So as this is moist, it will stick on its place. You can discard the water that is collected here and then proceed for filtration once this is cooled down. So we waited for this reaction to come to root and I can feel the round bottom flask with my fingers and I don't feel heat. That means it's definitely less than 37 degrees. So I'm going to assume 
that this, this is a safe temperature to work at. So at this point, I'm going to stop my uh, my water from the chilling lines and carefully clamp out my condenser, leaving my round bottom flask on one of the clamps. And I will place my condenser out of my way. Make sure my round bottom flask is nice and secure. At this point, I'm going to measure out four milliliters of sodium hydroxide per unit, which is six molar in concentration. As you can see, we have forms of precipitous mass, and that might be due to the phenol. And we are adding NaOH because NaOH is strong enough base to deprotonate the protons from the phenol, and then that we can uh, turn the phenol back into the solution phase. So I'm going to add dropwise while my stirring continues, and slowly you can observe the solution is turning uh, turning clear. The precipitate is dissolving. And the pH is rising. That, that, and the pH will eventually become more than the pKa of phenol, which would help it be product. I'm slowly going to add to the side because I noticed there are some precipitates on the walls. So I'm slowly going to squirt my sodium hydroxide to the walls. And I'm going to let it stir for about half a minute. And at this point, I'm going to unclamp it and use my use my own hand to sort of swirl it around so that I dissolve all the adhered precipitates on the wall. Once I'm satisfied, I'm going to let it stir for another half a minute. Meanwhile, I'm going to make sure my filtration assembly is ready. And I have an Erlenmeyer flask underneath uh, my stemless funnel. I have a filter paper which is ready. And now I think the pH would be basic enough to deprotonate all the phenol and at this point uh, what I'm going to do is swirl my round bottom flask and slowly pour the contents through the walls of the filter paper and I'm going to let gravity do the work where it will filter out all the palladium on carbon and the product that we what, what we want would come into the aqueous solution underneath the filter underneath the filter there might be some uh, residual products so what i'm going to do is to squirt about two to three minutes of distilled water swirl it again 
and I'm not going to add it right now. What I'll wait is once all my all of the uh, liquid from that filter paper is finished. At that point, I will add this uh, the, the remaining washing solution. That will solve two purposes. First, it will take out, out all the remaining phenol from here, and second, it will wash the filter paper so that all the contents are in in the early part. So, so I think the liquid is about to get finished from the filter paper. So I'm going to pour all of the remaining liquid and I'm put this round bottle flask here and set it aside. Now we let this drip dry. And once that all, all our contents are in the early mark class, we will proceed to acidification step. So we have uh, allowed gravity filtration uh, to collect all our liquid in our early mark class. At this point, it is very important to take off your filter paper from your funnel, which has palladium on carbon, and put that palladium waste into a special container that has water in it. Be always sure that you have water and make sure your waste is submerged in water. Just because palladium on carbon is pyrophoric and we don't want fires while working. Now we, we know that all our phenol is in the phenoxide state in this solution. Another way to get solid product is to acidify the solution. So for acidification, what we are going to do is we are going to use two molar hydrochloric acid and I am going to take out some hydrochloric acid into a clean measuring cylinder and let's say I am just going to measure out roughly 10 mils as of now, but we might not use all of that. Another important point is always use secondary containers when you have big volumes to transfer. So Instead of transferring hydrochloric acid from a big container, it's safer to transfer from a small container. We have prepared an ice bath. Uh, and this ice bath will help cool down our solution while we acidify. So what we are going to do is snug, try to snug in our our in my class into ice so that it sits nicely sort of in, in, in a cavity of ice. Now that will solve two purposes. Firstly, cooling the solution down will reduce the solubility of our phenol when we acidify. And second, acid-base reactions are usually exothermic. So it's safe if we sort of cool the reaction down while acidifying our alkaline solutions. We are also going to use pH strip to, to bring the pH of the solution around pH 1 to 2. So if you can see the color, we should be able to see color around this range. For doing that, we are going to take out a pH strip. and place it handy for our use. And 
at this point, we are going to start acidifying our solutions because our <coughs> liquid in Erlenmeyer flask is, is chilled enough. So this is our HCl. So we are going to take some amount of HCl and I'm going to swirl and add HCl simultaneously. And as you can see, as I'm adding, you may you may see precipitates for me. Right? As these precipitates are forming, this indicates that our solution is turning acidic eventually, and we need to continue till our pH turns almost one. So I'm going to add a couple of mils of HCl. Keep it under ice while adding swirl. And after swirling a bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test for pH. So what you can do is you can take a glass rod and you make sure that it's clean. You can dip your glass rod gently and place it on pH paper. You can see the color is almost dark green, which, which tells you that the pH is more than 10. What we'll do is we'll continue adding sulfuric acid, or oh sorry, hydrochloric acid. We're going to add a couple of milk this time. Keep swirling. of a couple of mils, I'm going to do a quick pH test again. Uh, it's still alkaline. What I'm observing is I need continue like a constant precipitate that does not dissolve. So as I add HCl, I see quite precipitate. But as I swirl, they eventually dissolve, which tells me that the solution has not reached enough acidity. Again, always keep checking your pH and remember filter paper or pH papers are reusable, so you can reuse even if it, it, it's discolored. We are reaching enough acidity so that the precipitates are staying a little longer. What I'm going to do is to switch. Make sure that you guys observe this. Once we add, see you, you see white precipitates. And they are staying a little longer. That means we are reaching close to our desired pH point. Although visual indicators are useful. Always remember to 
test for pH using your pH strip. It's still quite alkaline. So, you will require some more hydrochloric acid. you can see the precipitates are not dissolving. That means the pH has dropped less than the pKa of phenol and pKa of phenol is around 10. So we know that pH should be less than 10. Now to test this, let's, let's use a fresh pH strip. and test for the pH. So we'll dip our glass rod and test the pH. Now this is green but it's not as intense green as we saw previously. So at this point we ran out of our hydrochloric acid so I'm going to uh, transfer 5 mils into my graduated cylinder work from there. And I think I'm confident that this much of HCl should be sufficient. And after this point, what you would observe is your precipitate is starting to thicken, it will turn into a consistency that a yogurt has. That's an indicator that a complete precipitation is underway. We are going to test pH again. And as you can see, the color is it lightening, so we are turning into light green domain, which is around six to seven, or not six to seven, but it's eight to nine pH range. We need some more HCl. And it is important to be patient with this step because if you don't acidify your solution enough, you would lose a lot of your product into the aqueous solution. As you can see, the solution is turning uh, the solution is turning the pH strip into yellow instead of green. So we are near neutral pH. And now we will only require a couple of mils more to convert this to uh, pH 1. Going to take another pH strip. And use my glass rod and test for pH. So as you can now see from the color, we are about pH 2. 
which means that we have reached sufficient acidity uh, sufficient acidity to perform our next step so just for uh, just to confirm that there are no more uh, in oxide left I'm going to add just 0.5 ml and cool it and stir and after this we will proceed to extract this using liquid liquid extract welcome back so in previous step we acidified our solution and that caused our product to precipitate out but we still need to isolate this product and have it a way to quantify it. So what we are going to do is perform a liquid liquid extraction uh, and as you might as you might remember from your previous labs we use separatory funnel for liquid liquid extraction. We are also going to use two early mayor flasks and I've labeled them O and A which stands for organic and aqueous which would help us later if we are if we forget which class contains the organic layer. Uh, before we start, I always like to do a leak check. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour in a very little amount of ether and I'm going to see if there are leaks. So at this point, I can see that we don't have any leaks, right? So our separatory funnel is good for, for, for use. What I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer all this content into the separatory funnel. And remember, there might be some uh, some product stuck on this burden mark class for which I'm going to use a little bit of diethylether, approximately two to three mils. And I'm going to swirl this and transfer this into my separating pump. We will need approximately 20 mils to extract our product. So I'm going to use this measuring cylinder and weigh out approximately, uh, measure out approximately 20 mils of diethylether and put it into the separating pump. Before we proceed, I would like to remind all of you that you should have your stop cord and when you when you give this a shake, you should always let this separating funnel to wet because pressure builds up. A good way to hold this is you have your one finger on the top cap and thumb and the three fingers holding the, the body and then you can give this a couple of shakes and and then vent. I don't know if you can hear this but there is a squeaky noise which lets me know that the pressure is releasing and I'm going to do this a couple of times. just to make sure that everything is extracted in evil. And I'm going to place this on my ring stand to open my cap and let the layers separate. As, as you may know that 
dietyl ether is less dense than water. So in this case, the organic layer is going to form the top layer and the aqueous layer is going to be the bottom layer. As you can see, the layers are slowly separating out and we will give, the, give it a swirl to make sure the layers are completely separate. There are some bubbles that are still at this interface. Uh, we want to get rid of those. We'll wait for a couple of minutes to see if, if it settles down. So uh, we, we let this settle for some time, but we can see that this is still not clearly separated. So this looks like some sort of an emulsion. Uh, and what we are going to do is we are going to add a little bit of brine. And brine is a saturated solution of sodium chloride in water. And what that does, it, it, it interacts with water much more than the organic phase and helps to break down the emulsion. So once we add a little bit of brine, I think we should, and after we give it a shake, I think we should be able to see the layers of it. As you as you as you can see, the the layers which were not clear are now clear. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this aqueous layer out into my aqueous flask and take the organic layer out in my organic flask. And then I'm going to give this aqueous layer another wash because there might be uh, uh, some product which is still not completely. Uh, extracted by the ether. So this is my aqueous flask that has an A on it. So I'm going to slowly open my operating funnel and I'm going to pay a close attention to my layer and I'm going to stop as soon as this dietyl ether layer comes to this junction. I'm going to slow my flow and I'm going to stop at this point. I'm going to take out my organic container and put my organic waste, well not waste, but organic product into my other flow. I will then transfer my aqueous layer back into the separating funnel. And use approximately 25 ml more dietyl ether. So I'm extracting for the second time and during the second extraction, I will probably get most of the product into the organic layer. You 
will let it settle and then transfer this aqueous layer into our aqueous flask which is right here and we will transfer our organic layer into the organic flask which has previous extraction uh, uh, liquid in it. And at this point, since we have extracted from water, this organic layer might have traces of water in it. So we are going to use sodium sulfate as a drying agent to dry this out. And once our solution is dry, we will filter it and protoevaporate. it. As, as you can see, it is again making uh, hazy layers. So I'm going to add a little bit brine again. Now my layers are completely separated. Uh, you can see two clear layers. Uh, I'm going to transfer my aqueous layer into my aqueous container. Finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out 5 ml of dietyl ether. Approximately less than 5 would be fine. I'm going to put this in the separating funnel and I'm going to give it a wash so that I am sure that all of the products that, was, that are stuck uh, are back into my ether. Now we have our organic layer with us, which has traces of water, and I'm going to add sodium sulfate, which I have measured approximately one gram. Uh, you don't need to have one gram, but it, it usually works. Approximately one gram is enough, and I'm going to add sodium one, this amount of sodium sulfate and give it a swirl. And as you can see. The, the sodium sulfate is stuck, it's not free flowing. That means uh, I need a little bit a little bit more sodium sulfate. Uh, so I have some sodium sulfate here. I'm going to take out going to take out some sodium sulfate and I'm going to add a little bit more and see what happens. And once you give it a swirl, I can still see the I can still see the all the sodium sulfate is stuck. So I I think a little bit more is required, but keep swirling because sodium sulfate takes time to dry your solution.
I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly scratch the surface of my flask just to see how sodium sulfate is. And I can see it is it is still moist. So what I'm going to do is uh, add some more and wait 10 more 10 minutes for it to dry my solution out. So our solution, the organic organic solution is now is now dry. Uh, and what we are going to do is we are going to filter this solution into a long bottle flask which I have pre-weighed and it's important to pre-weigh your flask because once you remove your solvent you can measure the weight mass of your flask and then that will tell you how much solid you have. So you are going to place this here and as you remember from the last step what are, we are going to do a filtration. We will fold the filter paper into half and then into yet another half Place it on the ring and make sure this thing is at proper height so that it sort of goes into my round of Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my organic layer and Slowly detach a liquid through this filter. There might be some product stuck on sodium sulfate for which you can use a small amount of diethyl ether, let's say 5 ml, and rinse your sodium sulfate with, with ether. Put that back in. I am going to repeat this step one more time. Once we are ready, uh, after we collect all the organic layer in our onboard class, we will go for the rotovac. So uh, we have our organic layer in the wrong bottom flask that we just filtered, so it's nice and dry. And we are going to concentrate or evaporate our solvent using the rotovac. Now, as you might know, this machine applies vacuum to, uh, to, to make a lower internal pressure that will facilitate the boiling of your liquid at less than its boiling point. So what, what we are going to do is we are going to place it at the joint, we are going to clip it securely, and then first we are going to roto starting to rotate and we are going to then submerge this into our water bath which is nice and warm shouldn't be too hot you should also make sure that you have cold water running through the condenser and once you are ready you can press uh, the vacuum make sure the air vent is on so 
And once your vacuum pump is on, slowly turn the air vent off so that it will build vacuum inside your chamber. As you see, your uh, organic solvent is being vaporized and you should slowly see a solid product forming when uh, your, your, your organic solvent is, is, is disappeared. I think we can stop this and then retake. Our uh, ether is being rotovap for a while now, and you can slowly see some solid forming inside the vessel. And as more and more ether evaporates, you, you should be able to see solid appearing. One, one useful point about ether is it's low boiling and thus evaporating Ether is easy. At this point, most of your ether is is has been evaporated and you have solid product in your round water glass. Now we have our nice white solid powder inside the round bottom flask. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scrape off the insides of this round bottom flask with my spatula and I I'm going to uh, oh. So we now have nice white solid inside our round bottom flask. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to weigh this round bottom flask with the solid. And since I have pre-weighed my round bottom flask, I will know how much product I've got. And then I'm going to calculate percentage yield based on that mass. I'm, I'm also going to take melting point and IR of the product and those data would be provided to you. Thank you. Hi again. So welcome back to uh, saponification. For our experiment, we need a round bottom flask that I have cleaned and dried, and I have stir bar which is placed in the round bottom flask. I'm also going to require a reflux condenser for refluxing our reaction. I'm also going to require a measuring cylinder to measure out uh, sodium hydroxide solution and sand bath for heating our reaction. We have a lab stand which, which has a jack on it. We have securely placed our pot plate and we have clamps to stabilize our setup. So, in, in, in terms of chemicals, we are going to use sodium benzoate and we are going to use this special pump which is primed for 1.5 ml. So, we need to require two pumps to deliver three milliliters. So, what I'm going to do is going to lift this pump up and drop it down and it is going to squirt 1.5 ml and I'm going to do it one more time. Hi there. Uh, for our experiment, we are going to require some glassware and for heating our reactions, uh, we are using a 50 ml round on a flask that is charged with a magnetic stir bar. We are going to use a reflex condenser that we have used previously to, uh, to clamp it on our round bottom flask 
and read the reaction to reflux. We are going to use a volumetric cylinder to measure out uh, volumes of sodium hydroxide. And we have finally some sand in a, in a sand bar to heat our reaction. We are going to use this special pump for methyl benzoate because it's a liquid and needs to be accurately measured. Uh, this is a different kind of pump where you just lift the pump up and drop it down and then this delivers the required amount of, of material. This has been primed for 1.5 mils. So for our experiment, we'll require twice the amount. So we'll use two pump squirts. So I'm going to lift this pump gently and let it fall down. This is this was the first squirt. And so now we have approximately three mils of methyl benzoate in our brown bottom flask. We are what we will now do is clamp our brown bottom flask on our hot plate. Make sure it's in the middle. And I'm going to start stirring slowly. At this point, I'm going to measure out 10 milliliters of 10% sodium hydroxide solution into my measuring cylinder. And this is our reagent for our reaction because it's a base and it's going to do a nucleophilic attack on the electrophilic carbonyl carbon of that ester bond in methyl benzoate. So we have measured 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide and under stirring, I'm going to add sodium hydroxide solution to my round bottom flask. I'm next going to lower lower my lap jack and place my sandbar underneath and start heating. Approximate setting for heating for this reaction should be around 300. During the time that my sand bath is heating up, I'm going to set up my reflux apparatus. So this is our reflux condenser. Uh, we are going to put in uh, the water in line at the bottom joint. Make sure it's secure, otherwise it may come off during your reaction if the water pressure is too high. Uh, we are going to take another hose and place it on the top joint. So then sort of adjust our clamp and make sure our reflux condenser is securely placed. Once we have our condenser placed, we will make sure that the exit hole is in the same. And I will slowly turn my water on. As I turn my water on, you should see water rise in the reflux condenser. I'm going to keep a very slow stream of water flowing uh, 
that will ensure proper water circulation but will not cause excess pressure so that my hoses come off. Once my condenser is ready, I'm going to lift my heating mat, heating apparatus, and make a gentle contact with the round water plant. At this point, I can feel that sand is making contact with my round water plant. And we will wait for this temperature to come to a reflux temperature. And we are going to reflux this reaction for 30 minutes. And we'll come back after 30 minutes and, and proceed for the next step. So our reaction has been refluxing for 30 minutes. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the heat and pull the lap jack down so that my, the sand bath is now not in contact with my groundwater glass. And I will let it stir and let it cool and come to room temperature so that we can then proceed with our work on. Last time we, uh, we lowered our lap jack and we waited for the reaction to come to room temperature and now I can feel that the reaction is cool enough for acidification. So at this point I'm going to stop water from the taps um, and I'm going to carefully unclamp the condenser. place my uh, solution on, on this, this cork right now uh, and I'm going to prepare 5 ml of hydrochloric acid initially and we are using, uh, we're using dilute hydrochloric acid which has 5 molar concentration. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my ice bath which I have prepared and I'm going to put this round bottle of glass in such a way that it is it has been cooled by by ice. So we are cooling our uh, solution and once this is cool enough, we'll proceed with uh, addition of our acid. And it's important to cool because lowering the temperature will reduce the solubility of benzoic acid that will be formed in acidification process. And secondly, acid-base reactions are usually exothermic. And it's important to cool them uh, for, for safe handling of our reaction. So I think it's, it, it is sufficiently cool. So I'm going to place it on my pot. And I'm going to use my rubber bulb to transfer hydrochloric acid as I, as I swirl my round bottle glass in ice bath. So I'm going to 
add my HCL drop wires and I will continue stirring. And as you can see, when, when I'm adding acid, there is there are formation of precipitates. The white precipitates are being formed, which which tells me that the reaction mixture is being acidified and the benzoic acid is being precipitated out. Now we will go to pH, approximately pH 2. After addition of a couple of gels of hydrochloric acid, I am going to swirl it a little bit and test the pH. Once I have swirled it sufficiently, these are pH strips where you can see the colors and what I am going to do is I'm going to take one One pH strip out. And I'm going to use my clean glass rod and essentially I will dip one end of my glass rod in the reaction mixture and place it on my little uh, pH paper. And as you can see, it is yellow and according to this chart we are in the range of around pH 4 to 5. So we need to acidify a little bit more. So I'm going to add a couple of mils of concentrated HCl again. Sorry, dilute HCl. I'm also simultaneously going to cool this while I'm swirling. The consistency you are looking for is somewhere between double cream and yogurt so uh, it, it, it feels like whipped cream right now in, in a good consistency now I'm again going to uh, check for the pH I'm going to use my glass rod dip it in and test the pH I can see that pH is still not acidic enough. So I think few more milliliters of HCl would, would be sufficient. What I'm noticing is there, there is a lot of precipitate that is stuck on the walls. So to dislodge them, I'm, I'm going to use this squirt bottle of distilled water that I have handy. I'm just going to squirt some water so that you can see uh, things dislodging from the walls. And once you have sufficient so, um, um, aqueous space to, to, to spread out or to homogeneously acidify your your solid sub, solid material. One more time, I'm going to check for pH. And as you can see, the pH is now acidic enough. And if you compare from the chart, uh, this is in the range of pH 0 to 1, uh, one approximately 1. So, 
process. I think we are good with the acidification process. Uh, I'm going to swirl this for one more minute in water. So we can now begin with our next step, which is extraction. Uh, we have benzoic acid precipitated in our groundwater flask, so we need to extract it. And we are going to use liquid-liquid extraction. And before we proceed, I usually like to do a leak check on my uh, So we have precipitated out our benzoic acid and now we are going to extract the benzoic acid using dietyl ether using liquid liquid extraction. And remember whenever we use separating funnel it's important to quickly do a leak check so I'm going to use dietyl ether and I'm going to couple of layers of diet either in my separating funnel uh, just to see whether the funnel is good to use or not. So I don't see any leaks so I think we are good as far as this apparatus is concerned. What I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer all this uh, solid material to my separating funnel. Uh, so I will pour all these uh, contents of my round bottom flask to separating funnel. And since everything is solid and organic in nature, what you can do is you can take 10 mils of diethyl ether and put it in your top bottom glass. Sort of swirl it a little bit more. Four. If you still see it's very clumpy, what you can do is you can use one of these spatulas to break down these clumps. Once you feel that the clumps have broken down, you can swirl one more time and try to pour it again. Uh, I'm, also, I'm going to do one more uh, batch of dietyl ether and pour it in my round of glass. I'll use half of it. other half. We have collected all our uh, diethyl ether in this flask and since we perform uh, liquid liquid extraction with water it's important to dry the, the solution. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add sodium sulfate uh, part by part and just swirl and what, what I'm observing is sodium sulfate is sticking and making clumps that means I need to add more. So I'll add a bit more to the same thing again. 
finally add my final duct and I will give it a good swirl. And I can see that some of sodium sulfate is now freely flowing. That means my solid, uh, that means my uh, solution is, is dry, it's free of water. I'm going to swirl this for another minute or so, so that I make sure the sodium sulfate adsorbs all the water uh, in that organic phase. And I'm going to let it sit. In the meanwhile, uh, I'm going to uh, prepare my filtration assembly. I'm going to get rid of the separating funnel that we used. I'm going to keep it aside. I'm going to take this O-ring to a proper height. I'm going to place a hundred milliliters pre-weighed ground bottom flask. Uh, Pre-weighing is I'm going to prepare a filtration assembly where uh, I'm going to place a filter in half and make the uh, filter from my piece of paper by folding it once and then folding it one more time. Uh, and you can see there are four uh, holes here, so you need to keep three poles to one side and one pole to the other side to make a cone which you can sort of stick into uh, this funnel and this will not stick so what you can do is you can take some dipel ether and, and moisten the filter paper with some organic solvent that way it, it, will, it, will, it will keep to keep uh, adhered to to the uh, to the funnel. What I'm going to do now is, since my organic phase is dry, I'm going to filter it out using decantation, and we are using filter paper just as a second layer of precaution, just in case uh, we drop some sodium sulfate, it doesn't end up in our ground water flask. Now, this sodium sulfate will still have su substantial benzoic acid, so uh, you, you will need to wash it out. And to do that, I am going to use the 5 mils of the ether ether and I'm going to wash the sides of my flask and give it a swirl, do it a couple of times. And transfer this organic phase back on my filter paper. We have made sure that most of the benzoic acid is was transferred into our round bottom flask. There might be a little bit uh, remaining on the filter paper. To address that, what we'll do is we'll take a couple of mils of dilute ether and wash our filter paper. And we will let this drip uh, using gravity and once we are ready, we will go to the rotovap and evaporate the dipel ether. So we have placed our organic phase which we dried previously and filtered 
into this pre-weighed round bottom flask which is of 100 ml volume. Uh, now what we are going to do is we are going to evaporate the ethyl ether and to do that we are going to use rotovap. Uh, so what we will do is we will clip our round bottom flask with this clip and we first start our rotation. Uh, once it's sufficient, it's rotating, we will lift it down and submerge it into the water bath. Uh, and then we will start our vacuum pump. Uh, and, and the air inlet is right now open and I'm going to close the air inlet so that the vacuum builds up. And we'll wait for ether to concentrate and you should expect some solids to form as the ether is evaporating. So uh, you can see small bubbles forming in, in the ground bottom flask, which means their diethyl ether is evaporating. And you can also see simultaneously your benzoic acid is being uh, precipitating out because your ether is, is evaporated. So uh, we'll let this run for a couple of minutes and wait for all the ether to evaporate. As you can now see, most of the ether is gone. And at this point, uh, you can stop Rotovapping. So we have evaporated all the diethyl ether and now we have pure white fluffy benzoic acid uh, which the, uh, and I'm going to weigh this round bottom flask. Since it was pre-weighed I will be able to tell how much benzoic acid I've synthesized and uh, we'll calculate percentage yield record melting point and IR and we'll send you the data for this experiment. This concludes the saponification lab uh, and the synthesis of benzoic acid.